All right, our keynote speaker has been researching UFOs for 20 years and believes that they constitute the greatest mystery of our time. Does anybody want to argue that? I don't think so. Not here, anyway. He is the author of several volumes of history and speculative books about the future. His latest work, entitled UFOs for the 21st Century Mind, is a fresh treatment of the entire subject of UFOs. In it, he discusses the important sightings, the encounters, the politics, the cover-up, ancient aliens, bizarre science, disclosure, and offers advice on being both critical and open-minded in today's world. He hosts his own weekly radio show. He is a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM and is featured in the new episode uh, documentary series, Hangar One. Go move on. Come on, you guys. Weren't paying any attention. All right. He is going to analyze the UFO cover-up as only he can do, and he will explain how the UFO phenomenon has quietly transformed our world, first from the presence of other beings here in our world, secondly from the acquisition of radical technology, and third from the need for eternal secrecy on the matter. Not our favorite subject. All three have contributed to the global system we have today, a nearly complete virtual totalitarianism that requires, for the time being, nearly continuous false flag events to corral and control the public. Using a broad geopolitical approach, he will explain multiple disclosure scenarios like premature disclosure, preferred disclosure, and people-driven disclosure. The result is a profoundly new way to understand one of the most paramount and least understood issues of our time. Please join me in welcoming Richard Dolan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's very humbling to be here with so many of you, and um, I've been many times to this conference, and uh, it's, it's always uh, an amazing experience for me because the people who come here are really my teachers. I learn more from the people here than you could possibly ever learn from me, and I just want to let you know I appreciate you, um, your conversation I've had with many of you, and I look forward to more of it. So uh, let's get going. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the introduction. Right, so I, I don't know why I do these topics. There's these broad, epic, it's like uh, the Iliad. You know, I, I don't have like a little thing that I do. I do the whole grand thing, the whole grand structure of the UFO phenomenon, and I keep coming back to that. You'd think I would just do it smart and just concentrate on one little aspect of it, but I can't, I can't seem to restrain myself. Um, I got into this field many years ago through politics. I've never really left that. It's always been my, my primary interest in the UFO phenomenon. I'm fascinated by the science. I'm fascinated by the idea of contact. Uh, but I've, I've never really left the, um, imp the political implications of this subject. To me, that's always been the most important thing. And uh, again, I keep coming back to it. So today I want to discuss what I feel is the, uh, the grand picture of the, of the phenomenon. And as I, I see it currently, the real power struggle. And yes, the end game, if there's an end game that's in mind. And you see the images, we have Barack Obama, Vladimir Putin, uh, Xi Xing, the leader of China, and uh, Mr. David Rockefeller down there. He's, he's in our mix. Remember, he's, I think, 158 years old now. <laughs> Something like that. Um, <clears throat> so I want to start by just giving my assessment of what I think is going on, the major assessment, what is going on. So one thing we know is we've had, one thing we think we know is retrievals of exotic technology, not simply Roswell. Um, Cape Girardeau from 1941, probably starting the ball rolling with capture of uh, some very, very exotic technology that did not originate from this civilization. Roswell and a number of other events, some of which have been discussed here at this conference to myself personally, uh, some of which have not received a, a whole lot of uh, investigation, but I think have been happening. In other words, I think there's been a, <clears throat> a program in place. Some of you are familiar with something called Project Moon Dust. Um, there are probably other programs as well that are designed to retrieve what we would call UFOs. 
and sequester them away to study them. That's been part of our world for the past uh, human lifetime. Uh, but it's not simply that. If it was simply capturing these pieces of technology and bodies, that's important. But something else that's been going on, of course, is that there have been ongoing, non-stop engagements with the US military and other world militaries with these objects. So we captured, we got some of this material, but they continue to invade military airspace. They fly around the world with impunity, and, um, and we keep bumping into them. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I was chatting earlier uh, this week with Peter Davenport, who gave an excellent lecture yesterday, um, about you know, how many UFO sightings are there worldwide per year. I mean, the fact is, we just don't know. You know, in North America, we have uh, his website, the National UFO Reporting Center, which is excellent. We've got the MUFON website, which is excellent. So those two websites have, I think for 2014, probably something like 14,000 uh, UFO sightings. 14,000 in North America, US and Canada. You have some Canadian sources that have another couple of thousand sightings. I don't know how much overlap there is, but I'm guessing not a whole lot maybe a little bit. Guaranteed, there's got to be more than 10,000 unique sightings in those databases combined, probably more. For every person who has a UFO sighting, there's probably at least 10 that have never reported it. Peter's opinion was that it's, that number's in the thousands, not 10. Let's just say 10, conservatively. I think that's probably conservative. That would be 100,000 sightings of what people think are UFOs in North America, just North America, just US and Canada, which is only 5% of the world's population. We have no idea of the total number of sightings of South America, because there isn't really a database to give us that information. We have no idea how many sightings there are in Europe. There really isn't a good database for that. Or Russia, or uh, the rest of Asia, China, India, over a billion people each in those countries. Africa. There's just, the information isn't there. Does that mean there are no sightings? Of course there doesn't. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that. So there has to be a lot of these sightings. If you have 100,000 in North America, are there, is there a million or more worldwide? Clearly those are not all legitimate alien spacecraft. I'm not suggesting that. But let's even be conservative and say 3% are real head-scratcher, puzzling, genuine UFO sightings. I don't think that's an outrageous statement. So what's 3% out of a million? You, know, you tell me, it's 30,000, I think, right? It's a lot. Is that possible that there's 30,000 genuine UFO sightings a year? Yes, it's totally possible. It's probably more than that. This is a global phenomenon. And that's part of the scenario. And of course, it gets no love from the mainstream media. So you've got this amazing thing happening every single day worldwide and no attention. It's as if it's just not there. I once thought of the uh, analogy of Wonderland, you know, Alice in Wonderland. So Alice sees the little rabbit hole and she falls down, chung, 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 down, down, boom, and she's in this incredible place where reality is upside down. Well, we have Wonderland. It's when you turn on your television and you turn on your mainstream media. It's this fictitious reality. <laughs> you know, we live in the real world where there actually are UFO sightings and you, you uh, enter Wonderland, the media world, where it, this isn't, is not a thing. So that's part of our world. So yes, one part of the reality is in, a in the classified world, there's been recoveries, uh, and there have been military engagements as well as a global phenomenon. Uh, some of these quotations here, by the way, these are just a few from uh, Freedom of Information Act acquired documents over the years. These are old, old ones from, uh, this one's from 1950. Since July 30, 1950, objects round in form have been sighted over the Hanford Atomic Energy Commission plant. Air Force jets attempted interception with negative results. All units, including the anti-aircraft unit battalion, radar units, Air Force fighter squadrons, and the FBI have been alerted for further observations. Holy smokes, if that had come out in 1950 when this was written, can you imagine the response the public would have given to that? When instead at the time the government was saying, no, nothing to see here, this is not a phenomenon at all. Well, clearly the public view and the classified view are two totally different things. By the way, the last statement that is on there says the Atomic Energy Commission states that the investigation is continuing. And what I've always found interesting about that is that in our um, acquired documents from the government, we never got any follow-up investigation. So clearly, there was one, 
But what was the conclusion? Well, we don't, we don't know what the follow-up was. And on and on. There's so many of these, and I don't want to belabor it. I've done that many other times. Uh, on my website, by the way, richardolanpress.com, uh, I did one article, which uh, I still think is useful, called 12 Government Documents. Um, 12 Documents That Prove Government Interest in UFOs. And I've got like a top 12 there. So with acquired technology, ongoing classified engagements, uh, you can imagine what our national security betters would think. They think this must be kept absolutely secret. This is too explosive. And that, I think, was their decision. That means control over media. That means control over the academic world. That means control over the scientific community. There are people who think, well, that's impossible. And I would just say, think again. It's really not that hard. Um, you know, back in olden times, like the 1990s, when I started researching this uh, pre-web, pre-internet, I think it was still uh, hard for people to wrap their brains around the fact that the intelligence community dominated our mainstream media so completely. I don't think that's really difficult to argue now. I mean, really, who doubts it? We have um, a handful of media corporations that control about 80 or 90 percent, I think, of everything that you're likely to see, read, or hear in the course of your day. They, they dominate it. Um, that's the media. Then there's the academic world and the scientific community, both of which have revolving doors with the national security apparatus. Scientific world, they'll never investigate UFOs if there's no funding. And if the subject's classified, which it is, then that means the funding will be classified. There's not going to be open public funding in the world of science for UFOs, aside from the fact that it's a known career killer, but there's just no money to do it. It's really not that hard to control it, in other words. So the UFO phenomenon is absent from those venues. It's very important. Um, the phenomenon has also created uh, the necessity, I think in, in the opinion of the, again, the people running the show, the creation of black budgets. Black budget simply formally means classified federal spending that's beyond the purview of Congress. In reality, black budgets, I think, are a bit more than that. Black budgets involve um, all kinds of financial dealings that are outside government including narcotics trafficking money, including uh, banking fraud money. Uh, there's trillions and trillions of dollars at the, at the center of the black hole of the world financial community that just go missing. And um, that's part of the picture too. And it's not simply to run and finance the UFO program, although I think that's part of it. I mean, basically, if you want to raise secret armies, then you need um, a lot of money and you don't always want to go to Congress for that. If you want to you know, engage in regime change constantly. You may not always want that to be uh, from your official sources of funding as well. So the, the, the whole role of financial fraud in this world, um, I mean, this is something that we really have not discussed, I think, intelligently as an adult uh, group of people in the United States, but it's there. And again, the UFO phenomenon is part of that. It's, I think it's part of the genesis of the black budget culture. Uh, involving, uh, well, as I just got ahead of myself, illegal financing, criminal financing. Yes, cocaine import agency. That's what they do. Hey, look, what are we, less than 100 miles away from the MENA, Arkansas airport, right? Remember, <laughs> not that long ago, a bit of infamous history, cocaine importation uh, right here, right in the backyard. That went on, and that's beyond political party. I think we can all understand that. That's Democrat, that's Republican. It doesn't really matter. So, um, but all of that is important. It's important to generate the cash for uh, research and also security. In fact, I had a conversation a couple of years ago with a very prominent scientist who told me point blank that, uh, you know, the research on the UFO tech program is very expensive, but that the money to provide security over that is uh, more expensive by an order of seven or eight times, he said. So for every dollar spent on research and development for a UFO science, he said, multiply that by seven or eight and you have the amount of money for security, which presumably is more than just uh, guys with guns, probably talking about managing media, uh, probably talking about creating massive underground facilities, um, you know, who knows, a lot of money. So the uh, result of that, of course, is that we have a system of runaway secrecy and, and I think as those of us who've looked into the black budget culture, we recognize that a lot of it is privatized. It's privatized. So when we talk about the UFO subject as classified, partly though, we have to talk about it as proprietary. Um, 
I think increasingly we're starting to understand this as a society that you know, our, our government and other governments as well are really dominated by private money behind the scenes. Uh, when you look at black budget uh, spending and black budget power, the very few public studies that we have on it have all indicated that the dominant amount of power in that community is not government so much as private. So like Lockheed and Boeing um, will usually have actually more power in, in some of these programs than official DOD liaisons and so forth. And, um, and, that therefore, and then if they get uh, patents based on some of the exotic technology, that's their proprietary thing. Um, and it's very hard to get a Freedom of Information Act request out of a private entity as opposed to the government agency. So it's very good for secrecy. These black budget programs engaged, are engaged in secret technology programs. That would have to be a no-brainer. By the way, all of this is simply an overview of what I'm going to get into in just a few minutes. Secret tech being, uh, well, the creation of our own objects um, and weapons weaponizing the technology. I had a long series of conversations with John Burroughs about this a number of months ago. I think John was right on about this. He really emphasized this point to me. And one of the key points of the research is you turn these technologies into weapons in a, what's probably a global kind of competition. So that, be, that could be electromagnetic weapons or extra low frequency or high-powered microwaves, mind control weapons, propulsion, material science. I think these are some of the primary areas that we might see, and there's probably many, many others, where uh, the technology that has come to us vastly far beyond where we are at, undoubtedly, nonetheless would probably give us some good ideas on where to proceed in the area of weaponizing that technology. Uh, the one result is that it creates a two-class world. Basically, those who are in the know, this many people, and those, the rest of us, who are like the little kids in the candy store pressing our nose to the window, trying to get inside, who are not in the system. Um, that's how it goes. One of the results, as I have argued for a few years now, is the creation of a kind of a breakaway civilization. What do I really mean by that? Um, basically, I mean that you have a group of um, people who are so far advanced, whose breakthroughs then become classified. If we, were, if we were part of a classified program to study some ET technology that was recovered and we're figuring it out, uh, we would probably have some really great ideas, some of which would be so great that our bosses would say, well, we're going to just classify that because that's a little bit too important to let out to the world, um, whether it's through energy or what have you. Uh, we would be able to continue on our research. Of course, the rest of the world would be blocked from pursuing that. And after enough period of time, I would suspect that um, we would be able to leapfrog over ourselves, so to speak, into some serious breakthroughs that would prevent the rest of the world, that the rest of the world would be prevented from going into, whether that would include anti-gravity, whether it's some type of field propulsion uh, or other kinds of weapons. We can imagine, we can guess, but I think these breakthroughs could be such that we eventually could consider ourselves a separate civilization. Could we go off-world with our own technology? Probably. If we go off-world, would we have encounters and gain knowledge that the rest of the world would not be able to have? Probably. Admittedly, this is speculation, but I think this ties in with some of the things that we're, we're learning or information that is leaking from various sources. So I think we can call it a separate civilization, one that's broken away from our own, and I've uh, believed for years that that is part of the mix of what's happening. Um, now, one of the things that I could speculate about them is that, if, again, if we were part of that group, we would be dealing with the presence of this other or others, maybe multiple groups, and being militarily minded, probably, we would be thinking we have to catch up to them. And some, you know, it would be an important thing for us. So I think that's probably part of it as well. Um, in order to do that, of course, that accentuates the need for secrecy. You don't want to tell the whole world what's going on when you're trying to just desperately catch up to these other beings um, of intentions unknown. Hiding breakthroughs that we have. That, I think, is a legitimate photograph. It looks pretty, pretty nifty. Energy propulsion breakthroughs hidden from the rest of the world and much more. I once received an email 
a uh, little over a year ago from a gentleman. I never got an identity out of him. He seemed, he talked a good game. And he uh, said to me, uh, this is regarding um, my previous book, After Disclosure, he said, well, I liked it, but it was um, really kind of short on um, the fear. He said, I think you underestimated the fear that we in this world have over criminal repercussions for disclosure. In fact, I think I wrote quite a bit about it, but maybe, maybe he skipped that part, I don't know. <laughs> but he did say, we are, um, you know, having, uh, first of all, for anyone even to, to have any kind of cooperation with any kind of disclosure, we would have to have absolute 100% immunity from any kind of prosecution, because he said everyone would be, would be terrified, everyone is terrified of uh, legal repercussions of the secrecy for so long. And he said, realistically, none of us would ever be confident that we could have such assurances. So it would be very difficult. I mean, it's really true, like we could promise, oh yeah, we won't prosecute you, but then when the information comes out, here come the torches and pitchforks anyway, and that's just how people will be. I think there'd be a lot of angry people uh, once any kind of these revelations came out. So his, uh, his point to me was that there, this causes a kind of paralysis. I had another conversation with a known gentleman who has told me that this topic of disclosure actually does come up every several years, maybe every five years, I think is what he said, and uh, that he himself had been on a subcommittee that was charged at one point with looking at the legal implications of disclosure of the reality of UFOs and extraterrestrials. He's not even a lawyer, but he is a smart guy, and he said the... Um, conclusion that we had was that the lawsuits alone would be staggering. And he was talking about just mundane, like a defense contractor lawsuit. You know, one defense contractor might have access to some of this exotic technology and the other one maybe wouldn't. Maybe there's a lawsuit there, you know, for unethical business practices and um, preferential treatment and the like. And that's just one little, little aspect. Th there's a, a lot of this disclosure paralysis, uh, the impression I'm getting. And I think the real paralysis, when you look at the grand picture, is simply the global transformation that is likely to have uh, to occur after disclosure. I was chatting with a very nice gentleman here who said, well, I don't really think it's, I think that that whole thing is overstated. I think people can handle disclosure. Uh, but my, my take on it is it's not really our psychological ability to handle this that's the key. I mean, maybe a lot of us would be okay with it. I, although maybe some of us wouldn't. But I think the real issue would be um, the, the transformation to our infrastructure. I mean, the one thing that I've, I've constantly been able, unable to get away from is the, if a president were to say that this is real, he'd say, okay, it's actually, it's come to my attention that this phenomenon is in fact real and that some of these objects are not made by us and they're highly advanced. And then of course, you know, there's a whole zillion other questions that would be asked after that. But one, one obvious, uh, thing that would have to come out is, well, what's their source of energy uh, that allows them to engage in the behaviors and the maneuvers that they do? There's zigzagging, there's instant acceleration. This is not using petroleum. So whatever the source of energy, if it's zero point energy or some form of fusion or something even better, um, it's a post petroleum world right, right off the bat. And that's a complete transformation of our global infrastructure, probably for the better, definitely for the better but it's still gonna be very disruptive. That's just one thing. Then you got the political blowback. Again, you know, the torches and pitchforks crowd. There's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna be implicated for deeply criminal activity in the maintenance of this secrecy, I have to think. And then all of the other cultural changes that are going to come as a result of this. And then, of course, the questions that people will be having of who, who are these other beings? What are these beings? What about the abduction phenomenon? I'm sure there have been many people in this room who've had what they are certain are abduction experiences, and I'll bet many of them have. I don't know, but there's going to be a lot of people in this world who are going to be talking about that, and it's, it's going to stir up a lot of uh, unresolved issues, I'm sure, that will take a long, long time for us to work out as a civilization. So I think, um, you know, it's not to be... Um, put aside and belittled that this is going to be an, an enormous transformation of human civilization uh, if this information ever comes out, as I believe it will. So that's an overview. Uh, let's keep going here.
So that's, that's my basic uh, take on the general situation that we're dealing with in the year 2015. So we talk about the question of disclosure, and um, it's funny, I've, uh, I never really saw myself as someone who would talk about UFO disclosure. I was never that way. I got into this through the field of history. But of course, I kept looking at things like the cover-up, and I think inevitably I got, I got pulled into the disclosure question. And uh, now I'm, I'm in it, I guess. And I do like to think about it. I'm, just cur I'm curious about it. But when we talk about disclosure, um, I think a lot, of it, a lot of our discussion hinges on the nature of what our political system is. So for example, you go back to the 1950s. Uh, there were researchers and activists uh, relating to the UFO phenomenon back then. Sure, there were. There was a group called NICAP, which was um, dedicated you know, to having, among other things, congressional hearings on, on the matter of UFOs back in the late 50s and into the 60s. This was one of the biggest issues that they had. Uh, they were centered out of Washington, D.C. They were led by a retired Marine Corps Major, Donald Kehoe. And it was an important issue. And uh, there were several times when NICAP thought they were going to be able to have congressional hearings. And at, you know, every time, at the last minute, the uh, rug was pulled out from underneath that, and it didn't happen. But in that world, in the world of the late 50s, it's not hard to see that people could believe that congressional hearings was the best way to go. People believed in the American system. Um, we had a, a, a situation at the time where people believed that this was a functioning democratic Republican system of government. Congress was the voice of the people. We elected those, pe those guys into office and they were responsive to us. And so that the logical step would have to be have open congressional hearings so that we as a public could discuss this in the proper way. Totally logical way of thinking. And, you know, that attempt was tried. Uh, tried and failed several times in the 50s and 60s, didn't happen. And, it, and we've never had congressional hearings since the late 60s. Uh, my uh, colleague Stephen Bassett is currently attempting to try to get actual congressional hearings going again. And if he had, gets it to happen, I think that'd be fabulous. But we haven't had anything for almost 50 years. So that's if we had a functioning system. But what if we don't have a functioning representative system? What if we have a system that, you know, the wheels have basically fallen off? Or as I've often said, it's basically like seeing a dead body on the side of the road. That's our government, that's our country. Dead body, you poke it with a stick, it doesn't move, but you think, oh, well, he's wearing the same clothing he had on last week, so we must be fine. The clothing is our system. The clothing is the offices, the presidency, the, the uh, Supreme Court, the Congress. The, the clothing, the appearances, the trappings are the same. Those haven't changed, but fundamentally, inside everything has changed, and the old system basically is now uh, it's a corpse of a republic, and maybe we can revive it somehow, but right now it's just not doing very well. It's been transformed. I'll get into that in a minute. But if you don't have a functioning democratic system, then does that affect our strategy for disclosure? If, if you're living in a kind of system that we might characterize as invisible fascism, invisible because it's not like, it's not like 1930s Hitler fascism. That was in your face. You know, they would march down the streets you know, letting you know that it was Ein Reich, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Fuhrer, they, it was very upfront. Or in Stalin's Russia, it was very upfront. It's not really upfront here because I, I think um, lessons have been learned. You can call it freedom, give us our Monday night football and our Dancing with the Stars, and you just do what you want to do. It's really, you know, it's kind of what we have. So, um, so I call it invisible fascism. It's invisible because we don't see it, it's not discussed, but it's there all the same. So in that type of a situation, um, what is our political system? I mean, I don't really, I wouldn't necessarily call it fascist exactly the same way as the old system, but I don't really think we've given ourselves the conceptual tools to figure this thing out very well. We're not really talking about it as a society. Uh, one thing I, I ask myself is how much freedom do people have? I think freedom goes in a gradation. It's not all or nothing. We can say we have a free society, but I, I think that's a little simplistic. So we have some freedoms and we have other things where we're not free and it moves along a spectrum. And I think it's always been like that 
So it's just helpful for us to think these questions through. How much freedom do we have in our world today? So with that said, uh, I want to talk about why or how uh, the cover-up works in my own opinion, particularly in an international manner. I've wondered about this for a long time because we realize the UFO phenomenon is not simply the United States. It's global. So you would ask yourself, well, what's stopping other countries from disclosing the truth? Why wouldn't they? Well, let's talk about that. One of, the, uh, one of the key things, of course, is secrecy, as we've been talking about. We have black budget agencies, we have the NSA, we have the NRO, that is the National Reconnaissance Office. They manage all of the spy satellites. They are ultra, ultra, ultra secret. Um, there's little question in my mind that any space-based UFO activity, and there is a history of that is going to be monitored and recorded by the National Reconnaissance Office um, and uh, by the NSA and probably a host of other black agencies which their existence may be classified to this day. There's probably, I mean, consider this. The NSA existed in secrecy for well over a decade before it was outed in the mid-60s. The NRO existed in total secrecy for about 30 years. No one knew it existed until around the year 1990 or so. It, was, it actually would have been a felony to mention its existence uh, on the floor of Congress up until around 1990. So um, America has a history, a long history actually, of having large, very sophisticated agencies, the existence of which is not even acknowledged. And you know, back in the early 60s, the NSA very possibly had the best computers in the world. And they were NSA, no such agency. They didn't even officially exist, but they had probably the best computers in the world. So just think about that for a minute. So that's one way that this, the cover-up operates, is just through intense secrecy and classification and keeping uh, control over the media and, and things like this, as I've discussed. But another way is through international collaboration. Here's, here's a, a little fact that I've just recently um, uncovered. I did, was doing my own research on global military spending. So I think most of us realize the United States spends uh, by far, by far more money on military than any other nation. Uh, the number of, as of 2014, and one source that I looked at, had the U.S. expenditure as uh, about 38% of the total global spending. Uh, China came in at second at 8%. Russia came in at third at 3%. So the United States is just way ahead. But it doesn't end there. When you look at all of America's close strategic allies, like Britain, uh, Germany, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the like, when you add all of those up, you have a, about a, almost 85% of the total military spending in the world is dominated by the United States and its key allies, which I think is an astonishing number when you really think about it. And within that system, of course, the United States is easily the top dog, obviously. Uh, particularly when you look at uh, collaboration among uh, NSA and the NSA equivalents of other nations, you know, Britain's GCHQ, uh, and then over in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, we've heard of the uh, operation known as Echelon. I don't know if that's the name anymore. That's a global electronic intercept program run by those agencies and probably others now. But within that, the NSA is always top, top number one, because they have the most resources, the most money, the most power. Um, there's not a, probably a, a nation in the world that matters in which their leaders' cell phone conversations are not being monitored by the NSA. So it's a system that is dominated by the U.S. with a very few exceptions, which I'll come back to. So within that, we're looking at the creation of a global system that goes beyond nations. So it's not as if like Brazil, let's just use that as an example, the leader of Brazil is just going to say, well, you know, the hell with the United States, we're going to, we're going to talk about this openly, we're going to disclose, because if you were the leader of Brazil and you decided to do that, you'd have to be very, very careful. And the reason is you would know that the U.S. is probably aware of every single thing that you say, probably aware of every cabinet meeting that you hold and those of all of your advisors. So if you really were going to do this, uh, the U.S. would certainly consider that an act of aggression. And you'd better be very, very secretive 
if you wanted to get away with that. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Why else would nations remain silent? Well, in one way is bribery. Uh, this, this is, you know, pretty universal. Um, that's what's happening in places like Ukraine right now. You know, you, you pay off the new leadership that you install and you say, we're gonna give you, you know, tens of millions of dollars and um, we're gonna bring the IMF in and we're gonna privatize your whole country and impoverish your people, but you're gonna live great. And the leaders say, yes, perfect, we'll do that. Um, and then, you know, there's fear behind that. There's surveillance and blackmail, as I was saying, and threats. Who was I talking with? Yes, Catherine Austin Fitz, and also William Binney, who I've never met, but uh, NS, high-level NSA whistleblower. Both have spoken explicitly about um, how American political leaders, when they get to a certain level of power, uh, inevitably will have a sit-down with intelligence, whether CIA or NSA or FBI, who then lets them know that they've got the goods on them. Every little illegal thing you may have done, every little website you should not have gone to, they know about it, and they let you know that they've got you, and they control you. So there's all of that surveillance, there's that blackmail and implicit threats. I did have a, a, a chat a number of years ago with astronaut Edgar Mitchell, and um, this was when he was still talking a little more openly about his two ultra-elite sources that confirmed to him the existence of deep black programs to study alien technology and bodies. And yes, he used to say that. He doesn't say that much anymore. At one point, I, I wrote to him and I said, I'm aware of these statements of yours and I wonder if, uh, I'm not expecting you to give away the identities of these people, but maybe you can just give me some kind of information that would be useful. And he said, I would like to, but I cannot. Um, the people who came to me, he said, this is a verbatim quote, who came to me did so at great risk uh, professionally, personally, and risk to their families and I cannot give up their identities until after they have deceased. So that sounds like a, a pretty straightforward threat to me. It's risk to your family. Sounds pretty threatening. I think this is uh, probably the norm. Uh, fear. Well, I guess I've sort of covered that. And then last is uh, powerlessness. I mean, think of this, you know, any other nation that may have some knowledge about the UFO reality. I think there are probably many of them, of the leaders of many nations that do. But ultimately, the question would be, well, what can they do about it? A, they're powerless basically against the United States, and they're also powerless probably against whatever this is, whatever this presence is. It is a political nightmare, particularly, I think, for the U.S., but I think probably for any other of these nations, it would not be a fun issue to deal with. Much easier just to go about your business and let your handlers who've placed you into power deal with this. How is the silence kept? Well, it's kept through, uh, first and foremost, through control over the media. Uh, many people are familiar with uh, Operation Mockingbird. This is uh, going back to the 1950s. This involved CIA collaboration with the Washington Post and other mainstream media. A uh, very explicit program to put CIA influence in the, uh, in the US media. It's a, a subversion of uh, the free press, obviously. Uh, it's not the only example. Carl Bernstein wrote about this back in the 70s when he talked about how uh, there had been up to 400, actually at least 400 American journalists who had been on the CIA payroll for years and years as, uh, as patriotic Americans involved in the Cold War. Uh, they were not necessarily thinking they were betraying the country. They thought they were helping the country. But of course they were subverting the independence of American journalism. And I think what we've seen since then is uh, it's not just the CIA, the Pentagon spends billions of dollars a year managing social media and news and their own image. It's a big part of their expenditures. We're paying for that. We're paying to get hosed in the media by the Pentagon. It's coming out of our tax dollars. It's, it's really the truth. And, uh, and that includes, by the way, the creation of what are known as sock puppets on message boards. So if you read a new, one of those news articles on the web, you know, you see the comments below a lot of those comments, an unknown number, are Pentagon employees posing, this is true, this is not made up, posing as individuals 
uh, you know, with honest opinions, except they're not individuals with honest opinions. You know, a Pentagon employee could have uh, who knows how many identities that they would be managing every day through, through uh, these websites. They're called sock puppets, and there's a lot of them, and they, they have an influence. They, they do have an influence on public opinion, and to say nothing of simply the um, corporate media's uh, you know, fact that it's been in bed with the national security apparatus for years and years. I mean, they, they court, they court it. They don't really even need to be bribed. You know, having a good relationship with the Pentagon is a career maker. They're jumping over each other to get into bed with the Pentagon. Uh, the only hope that we have is the alternative media, and thank God we have it. Thank God we have the web. Uh, it's not perfect. We're not perfect, but we do our best. Uh, the big problem that the alternative media has is that it lacks, usually, uh, high-level access to those pinnacles of power, which is what the mainstream corporate media has. But uh, what we do have is analysis and um, some integrity, I, I guess I should say. And I think the, uh, the audience for the alternative media is beginning to dwarf that of the mainstream. I, I think we don't often realize the power we have. You know, we tend to think that CBS and NBC and Fox and NPR and all of those are what, where it's at, but I don't really think so. I think it's less and less as we move into the future. But wait, there's more. This is a, <laughs> a quotation from one of my uh, colleagues, which I've adapted. I love it. The extraterrestrial question is the secret sauce that flavors the bad meal known as geopolitics. And uh, yeah, that's pretty clever. I, I think what, what I mean by that is um, the, the UFO cover-up is not the only important thing happening in our world. I think we all realize that, but it is, it's part of it. It is part of what's happening in our globe today. So what I want to do now is try to put it in perspective and to see where its place is. I don't, I mean, whereas I do believe that uh, a disclosure of the UFO phenomenon is probably the single most revolutionary thing that we could do in this world today. It's not the only revolutionary act and revolutionary phenomenon. It's not the only important thing happening in our world right now. So I want to try to see it in the, in the bigger picture. It's part of the larger picture. And when we're looking at the people at the top of our human food chain, yes, I'm certain that they're looking at the UFO phenomenon. Uh, I think they're looking at the secret tech aspects of the UFO phenomenon. I think they're looking at the uh, implications of these other beings being here. Yes, I think that's absolutely part of the picture. But there's other things that they're thinking about as well. One is, and I think a big thing, is who's going to own all the stuff on planet Earth? Uh, I think that's a very, very major thing happening in our world today, and that's independent of the UFO ET phenomenon. Uh, and that there's a competition over this. Um, and that we are in the midst of, kind of silently, seeing the creation of a totally new political paradigm on our planet. One in which nation states are being replaced by other structures and entities. Um, I think also one thing they're thinking about is that, that the, the stuff is going to hit the fan soon in the sense of, um, of real crises that are brewing. I mean, look at the problems that we're dealing with right now globally, financially, for one. Uh, the crises that we're dealing now with, uh, with warfare in uh, the Middle East and elsewhere. I'll come back to that in a minute. Think of the problems that we're dealing with in terms of fresh water. California is a year away from running out of water. Sao Paulo in Brazil is about two months away from running out of water. That is a metropolis of 20 million people, and they're going to run out of water in two months. I cannot even begin to imagine what that's going to be like. They're already in a, in a severe state of crisis right now in terms of water rationing, and it's going to get much, much worse for them. That's just a few of the issues, and there's just so much else going on. Uh, the question is, how long is this paradigm going to be able to continue the way it is without things actually breaking down? And it seems to me that those people who are going to the annual Bilderberg meetings and members of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commissions and Bohemian Grove and the like are aware of this. They must be aware of this. They're not idiots. So they are undoubtedly, 
I say undoubtedly because I'm not part of their group, um, <clears throat> have decided for a need over global population control. They must be thinking this. We're seeing an end of the nations, a movement now toward formalizing what I call a breakaway financial structure. I talked about a breakaway civilization. But what we're seeing now in the creation of uh, not simply NAFTA, that's, that's old times, or GATT, but the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement or the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement, um, things that a lot of people are not really aware are going on are fundamentally remaking our world, and they are causing, well, basically, corporations, powerful corporations, are breaking away from national controls. That's actually what's happening. So one of the uh, things that leaked out with the, the current negotiations over the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and that's got, I think, 12 nations, including the U.S. and Canada, and uh, a number of the Asian nations, including uh, Australia, Vietnam. Vietnam's a signatory. I'll get back to them in just a second. What you're seeing is corporations now will have the ability to sue nations um, if, very, if those nations pass laws, for example, like environmental laws or labor laws and like, that impede the profits of those corporations. And they can then take the nations to court in a private court that is designated by this treaty. Holy smokes. Yeah, that's one thing, one of many. So they, they are breaking away from traditional concepts of national sovereignty, of you and me making laws and rules in our society, deciding what we want, that's no longer becoming relevant. And back to Vietnam, I just want to mention this, this is a thing that really upsets me sometimes. When we think about the Vietnam War, uh, we are aware, of course, that uh, 50 to 60,000 American servicemen and women died there. I think we tend to forget how many Vietnamese died in that whole conflict. Uh, the estimate that I read that was most uh, persuasive was close to four million. 4 million Vietnamese died. From 1945, the end of the war, when that fighting actually started with France, to 1975, 4 million. Yeah, and you know, when we think about who won or who lost that, we think America lost the Vietnam War. That's not true, America won that war. And America won that war because they pounded Vietnam into dust, and they forced them to submit, and Vietnam is now part of the corporate system where their slave labor is now feeding the global corporate system. So, they lost. And all of the people who were complaining about, uh, you know, uh, arguing against the war in Vietnam back in the 60s, who were branded as American traitors, I'll just say this. Vietnam in 1945, the Viet Minh were the only people who had fought the Japanese during that war and were still standing at the end of the war. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, who was an admirer of the American Constitution, had had a Declaration of Independence based on our Declaration of Independence, petitioned Harry Truman repeatedly for recognition of that nation, was denied, basically because Truman did France a favor. France wanted to go back in and recolonize Vietnam, and Southeast Asia. I mean, the French bailed during World War II, but they come back like, yeah, we're going to recolonize. And Truman wanted them into NATO, and he said, okay, we'll fund your war against the Vietnamese people, which was brutal. They got beat in 1954 at Dien Bien Phu. America comes in, reneges on the uh, Geneva Accords of 1954, basically divides the country into two, puts a dictatorship in the South. I mean, what are you going to do? This is really not a fun situation. And then you get Gulf of Tonkin a couple of years later, which is a complete lie, foisted upon the world. I mean, why wouldn't you complain about that? But our idea, especially back then, was, well, we must always obey our national security empire because they know best. Well, we know better now. It takes time to understand these things. But yes, Vietnam's been pounded into submission. So um, that's what it's about. And, and that model, by the way, has not stopped. That model continues today, and it's being used in Ukraine. It's being used in the Middle East. We're seeing the end of nations now. They are actually going away. A system of national government is being replaced by a system of corporate, corporate domination. It's the new royalty. If we can't go to the Bilderberg meeting uh, because we're not invited, because we're not important enough, we can go to the Aspen Institute every year over in Aspen, Colorado. They are actually kind of like a mini Bilderberg. And they will talk, you know, this is a lot of the same people, and they'll speak with a little more political correctness about their vision of the world. 
and it's a vision of the world in which there are lords and serfs. They put it nicely. But basically, you and your children, and your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren are going to be serfs working for the man. And that man might not be in America, he could be anywhere, but they're the people with that much, you know, at the top who have got everything. Control over the water, control over the minerals, control over the genetically modified foods, and everything else. That's the system that's coming into place. Now, there's a little bit of resistance to that system, and it comes from a couple of nations that are outside the United States' domination. That is Russia and China. Primarily, they're the only ones who really have the ability to stand up. And I'm not saying that they're angels, I'm just saying that they're outside the system. And the reason, then, that we have this undeclared war against Russia, and uh, secondarily against China, is for that reason, they're outside the system. You remember that movie Highlander? There can only be one. That's our world. Because this is now the unique moment in world history where there is the possibility of a very few people owning everything that there is worth owning on this planet. All of the resources and really everything that's worth anything. And um, so we're seeing it's almost like an end game is taking place. The, the interesting thing, or one interesting thing, is that this end game is being veiled from us. I mean, the way that it's being portrayed in our mainstream, lamestream media is uh, it makes it impossible uh, for anyone truly to understand what's actually happening. But what's happening is that this is the end game in a truly global power struggle to control all the stuff on our planet. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the ISIS war, as how, how that fits in. And you're asking yourself, well, I thought this was a UFO lecture. <laughs> well, it's, we're getting back to it. I promise you. I mean, if probably many of us remember back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when uh, the United States helped to fund and really helped create the Mujahideen in the war in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union at the time. And this is, this is giving billions of dollars of weapons and, uh, and support to, uh, well, what we would now call the Al-Qaeda group, basically. And that's really what they were, Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski back then called them freedom fighters. And, uh, and their job was to take down the Soviet power in Afghanistan, and they did a good job. They were, they were fanatics, they were dedicated, and they um, helped to bleed the Soviet empire during those years, and it was one factor that contributed to the demise of the Soviet Union, and that's true. So this is a, what we would call a neoconservative strategy, and it worked to the extent that it did. Uh, what we tend to think of these days is that well, we kind of made a little bit of a mistake and created a Frankenstein monster, and maybe we shouldn't have done that, but actually, I'll guarantee you that's not what they think. I'll guarantee you they think, that was a great strategy, let's do it again. And they've continued to do it. Because the Islamic fundamentalists are uh, great at destabilizing regimes and creating uh, failed states. And from the failed state, you can then move your people in and create a bunch of little proxy states, like, like with Yugoslavia. You break it into a bunch of little different countries and put your client states in there so you can control them. Uh, and that is exactly, that is precisely the model that's being done by the United States, and that includes the creation of ISIS, which you, this has been, we can trace this uh, genesis of ISIS to the early 2000s. Uh, through the Bush administration, through some of the actions of Condoleezza Rice and some of the other people of the Bush team back in 04, 05, 06, to fund uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalists in a war that was going to be then first against Syria, which has been continuing, of course, and uh, also to break up Iraq, uh, all of which has been going on fully apace. So what we see is this group that is now known as ISIS. Um, they've really gotten their full, you know, guns since uh, 2011. We keep hearing how ISIS fighters are going through the very porous border of Turkey. How is that? Turkey is a NATO nation. Turkey is very closely allied in their military infrastructure with the United States. Are we really to believe, I mean, let's get real here, that um, Turkey can't control this? Turkey knows exactly what they've been doing, and the United States knows exactly what they're doing. They're bringing these people over the border into Syria for the purpose of destabilizing that regime. Uh, Bashar al-Assad, that's exactly what it's all about. But they can't let it be known. And then the New York Times just recently uh, acknowledged that, yeah, American troops are accidentally, American air aircraft are accidentally dropping weapons over to the ISIS people. <laughs> I wish I could say I'm making this up. 
And the New York Times, of course, has to spin it in a certain way. We can't really tell that they're ISIS. Really? Really? I mean, I look at maps of the ISIS, they, you know, you could just pull up CNN and it'll tell you exactly where ISIS is and all of that. Um, and I'll guarantee you the NRO and all of our satellites have a much better understanding of that than CNN. Um, yeah, I think they can figure out what they're doing. They're accidentally, there's the air quotes, dropping in weapons to ISIS. There's a reason that they're doing this. There's a reason that Senator John McCain, and he did a great thing with John Burroughs, I'm not denying that, but there's a reason he's posing with the so-called free, uh, Syrian Free Army, which is a fictitious group that is comprised of factions funded and organized by U.S. covert ops under U.S. direction and um, direction of contractors the U.S. to engage in all this. The whole, this is what it's all about. All right, and behind the scenes, big part of it is to take down the so-called Islamic pipeline or the friendship pipeline. This is natural gas. We're talking trillions of dollars. That's what it's all about. It's about controlling the money. You have the whole point is to get around Russia to feed natural gas to Europe. So what are the pipelines to be used? Well, the preferred one, the NATO preferred one, is going through Turkey. That's a pretty good one, but there's a better one that goes from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, and that'll then go to Europe. The problem is, from the U.S. national security empire point of view, those are the countries they don't like, and they don't want them to get that pipeline. And they must prevent this. There's a lot of money at stake. None of this makes it into our news media, of course. When you talk about who's funding ISIS, do some Google searches. You know, Turkey, Israel, U.S., Saudi Arabia, Qatar. Yeah, the fact that Israel and Saudi Arabia are paired too, I find very interesting. The fact that they are working together now against Iran, I find very interesting. None of this happens without U.S. sanction. None of it ever happens without U.S. sanction. Saudi Arabia will never bomb Yemen without U.S. directing it and controlling it. S Israel would never be allowed to fly through Saudi airspace to attack Iran without the U.S. saying, yes, go do it. We want you to do this. None of this is independent, but the U.S. has to step back and pretend that this is other nations doing it. That's how it war we're in a, war a world of proxy wars. It's all about proxy wars and hiding. Hiding, because you can't be honest about what you're doing. I'm moving in toward why we're in an era of false flags, by the way, in case you haven't guessed. And then we get into the not-so-secret war against Russia. America's fundamental goal, and again, this is something that I think Americans typically miss, is that the United States empire must maintain the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. This started way back at the end of World War II, the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 that set the dollar on the gold standard so that the entire international financial community could actually have a stable reserve currency. And it was great, it worked really well. What that meant is that it gave the United States a unique advantage in the world. Every nation in the world knew, wherever you were, whether you were any nation in Africa or in Europe or anywhere else, if you had a dollar, you could trade that dollar in for gold, literally for gold at a fixed rate right up until 1971, when Nixon took us off the gold standard. And the reason Nixon took America off the gold standard is very simple. Knowing that there is a global demand for dollars, there's no other nation in the world that could say this. There's a global demand for our currency, only the United States. What that meant is, U.S. could print up those dollars to fund the war in Vietnam, could print up those dollars to fund the Great Society program and the like knowing that there is always a demand. And, um, but eventually, nations started to realize, oh, there's a lot of dollars in the world. Actually, more dollars than is reflected in the amount of gold. So they started, there was a run on the dollar in the late 60s, and gold was starting to flow out of Fort Knox. And to stop the hemorrhaging, Nixon just said, Ugh, we're temporarily moving off the gold standard. And, um, and that's what he said, temporarily. Of course, that's permanent. Now, the danger after that was still that uh, all of these dollars floating around the world would come back to the U.S. and cause a kind of hyperinflation. Of course, the logical thing to do would be to rein in your spending, stop the war, you know. But maybe, maybe that's not cool because people don't want to pay taxes. Uh, so what Henry Kissinger, this is a Kissinger's most brilliant geopolitical score. He goes to Saudi Arabia, 1973, 74, makes a deal. And he says, look, we will do, we will support you to the end. 
with the best weapons, with the best everything, we will make sure your regime is totally secure forever and ever. And we're asking for one thing, well, one and a half things. The one thing is we ask, we require that you sell all of your oil, all of it, to any country in the world, doesn't matter who, in dollars only, only in US dollars. And the other thing that we request, which they have done ever since, is that you buy US debt with some of your oil profits. So, and that's, that's the petrodollar. So that means that there remains, since then, since we went off the gold standard, the petrodollar system has meant that there is continued demand globally for dollars because the OPEC nations sell that oil in dollars. So you have to have dollars to buy it. So that allows the US to continue to crank it out and to spend six trillion dollars on the wars in Afghanistan and, uh, and Iraq over the past decade. Money that we could never, ever, ever afford. But just print it up because there's demand for it worldwide. It's now other nations are unhappy with that situation as of course they would be. The first person to try to break that system was named Saddam Hussein in the year 2000 when he decided with the encouragement of France to sell his oil in euros. Well within three years there was no more Saddam Hussein in charge of Iraq and the first major act of the new regime in April of 2003 was to sell their oil back in dollars again. You know where it's going. Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, same threat in the late 2000s, creating a uh, pan-African currency backed in gold called the dinar, and that was a serious threat. Gaddafi had to go. You have an U.S. orchestrated, what I'm now convinced, and many people are convinced, U.S. orchestrated Arab Spring, basically their version of color revolution, and, um, and forcing and creating uh, Islamic um, a training, rather, Islamic terrorists. That's what they are. Basically, Al-Qaeda offshoots in Libya that killed Gaddafi and took that whole regime over. Three and a half percent of the world's oil is in Libya, of the proven reserves. They just basically stole it all. Um, so that's the, it's necessary to keep the petrodollar from that point of view. And all of U.S. strategy is predicated on that. And when we think of petroleum, this is what it's doing. And when we come back to the UFO phenomenon, and we recognize that a disclosure of the UFO reality means a petroleum-free world, think about all of this stuff that I've just been trying to explain here. And you can see where it's tying in. So a threat to that petrodollar also comes from the so-called BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which uh, particularly Russia and China, which are creating uh, basically a, uh, a new, new banks, a new version of their own, a new type of IMF. Now China's leading the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, which is becoming very, very powerful and is going to be a major rival to US uh, dominated the Asian Development Bank. I think that's what it's called with US and Japan. This is breaking the power of the dollar. It's happening now. It's happening now. So when international trade is being done, predominantly in currencies other than the dollar, there won't be a demand for the dollar and they're all gonna come home to roost and we're gonna have a little bit of a problem here in this country. So that's what we're talking about. So the mission of Wall Street and the White House combined, because they basically are one unit on this, is to prevent this from happening. And uh, back to Russia, so they wanna break the Russian power. Russia's the first country they're gonna break to do this. and. Um, a bonus, I think, is uh, to control the, uh, the wealth in Russia. So you institute regime change. Yeah, I think they want to do it in Russia, just like they tried to do it in Ukraine. Break it into um, some client states. They move Monsanto into Ukraine, if you hadn't heard. Yeah, Ukraine, the, the black soil of Ukraine, it grows everything, everything you could ever want to grow. They don't need any, any help. They've got the most perfect soil. Monsanto's just moved in there in the last year. And part of it uh, is to just give Monsanto a nice gimme because they control things. But the other is to break Ukraine away from Russia as a trading partner because Russia will not import genetically modified foods, in case you didn't know. And Ukraine, which has traded their food with Russia since forever as their largest trading partner, can now no longer export their food to Russia. All right, so that's an act, basically it's an act of war against Russia. So this is all that's going on behind the scenes. So the folks in Europe, you know, even Angela Merkel, who's basically, you know, subservient to the United States and 
and Holland and France, uh, Francois Holland, leader of France, you can see that they are afraid of breaking <laughs> totally with Russia because Russia is a big part of Europe and they trade with them and there's a lot of pushback um, and now we're seeing it of course in all of these nations joining the, um, the new Chinese led AIIB bank. A lot of the European nations are joining it over the US objections. Not happy. So there's this, this, this kind of uh, the sides are being taken here and uh, the United States is seeing that they don't really have the kind of power over the situation that they would like to have. And the US public is also pub, uh, kind of against the war despite the incessant propaganda. You know, both of the parties are, are like insistent on basically having a war in Ukraine over this. I mean, when Congress is this stupid, honestly, when they're this dumb, how can we possibly expect them to have intelligence on the matter of UFO disclosure? I mean, I really wonder about this. They sound like a bunch of five-year-old kids. When they talk about these issues, it's, um, it just boggles the mind. Do they actually believe the things that they're saying? I, I think they do. I mean, maybe they do. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's just, it's amazing. So therefore, the plan basically, and this is, uh, let me get back, I'm gonna leave this and go back into the UFOs. Um, plan is to integrate Ukraine into the EU and into NATO, obviously. They, that was a blown, they, they kind of blew it because, um, you know, the US assumed that they could just waltz in and take over Crimea, uh, and take it away from Russia. That's, you know, that's impossible. You're just not gonna do that. Crimea has always belonged to Russia. Right up until 1954, when Khrushchev, after Stalin died, Khrushchev, Ukrainian, says, ah, Crimea now will belong to Ukraine as a gift. Well, in 1954, who really cared? It was all one big country, Soviet Union. Then comes 1992, the Russians are like, ah, we need, we need Crimea, because it's their one warm water port to the world. They have to have it. It's like the US having to have San Diego, for goodness sake. Um, and in fact, what the Russians did, they made a, a deal with the Ukrainian government, like we have with Okinawa or uh, Berlin or whatever. You have a permanent base there. And they would pay them a certain amount of money. So now here comes the US orchestrates a coup in Ukraine a little over a year ago and uh, brings Ukraine into the EU orbit, clearly now with the design to bring them into NATO. Anyone with a brain can see what this means. The US is going to take Crimea and the port of Sevastopol away, not only from the Russians, but arm it against the Russians. Do you really think? I mean, with the recklessness, the hubris, the ability to think that they could just do this to Russia? Russia? I'm sorry. That's just not going to happen. And it didn't happen. So, but that was the plan. It was in his bald face, just kind of in your face. So meanwhile, they'll just bleed Ukraine dry. They're doing it. Ukraine's economy has gone into the, at to the bottom. It's just horrible, the suffering that those people are dealing with right now. And I think uh, the idea is to keep that war going for several reasons. They want the war to keep going. The US wants that war. Uh, one is to um, force continued exodus out of eastern Ukraine, which is where all the money is. All the main natural gas and oil reserves in that region are. Uh, some of the great mineral deposits. That's why the fighting is so intense there. And they want to drive all those people out away from their homes. And if they have to bomb the hell out of them to do it, they'll do it. Get them out and put, you know, compliant, have compliant elections. And the other reason is to destroy Putin. You know, the U.S. is trying to take him down. And uh, I think their attitude is if it will pull an Afghanistan on from the 1980s, you know, just bleed Russia and destroy his reputation and hope that this takes him down. It's not working yet, I don't think it will, but I think that's the plan. The other plan was to crush the ruble, which John Kerry you know, worked out with the Saudis last fall, you know, to uh, increase oil production and drop the price of oil as a way to take Russians out. Again, the US tried doing this in the 80s and it kind of worked. I don't think it's working now. I don't think it's quite the same, but this is the plan. So they want to they have regime change for Russia. This really could backfire. Um, I, I mean, I don't really know how to feel about this because I don't want, I don't want to see hyperinflation in my own country and I hope I'm wrong. I'm not really normally a doom and gloom type of a person. But if, if this attempt fails and if the dollar loses its reserve status, at least in a significant way, we're going to have a serious problem with, um, with our own American economy here. Um, the solution, obviously, is the maintenance of a military global empire. That's what the United States is attempting to do. 
So with that as a background, um, I want to talk about what I see as disclosure scenario number one. I'm going to check the time here and see how I'm doing. Looks like we're doing okay. I call it premature disclosure. And that's a disclosure scenario that could happen this year. I don't think it'll happen this year, but the thing about disclosure, at least my own opinion, is that it's, uh, it comes like a thief in the night. You can't predict it. When I, I co-authored AD After Disclosure with Bryce Zabel, we, um, we really tried thinking this one out as best we could. We tried to be like a think tank, and, and our opinion was that disclosure would be a sudden thing. You know, there might be a rumor here and there for a couple of days, and then suddenly, shoo, our opinion is that it would just transform the world very suddenly. And I'm still of that opinion, even though it's five years later. <clears throat> In this scenario, so let's say that the U.S. gambit to take down Russian power fails. And let's say that Russia and China continue their own economic um, development so that they have their own gold-based currency. Putin's buying up a lot of the world's gold, by the way, with an artificially high dollar, and then he's, he's selling, he's unloading his dollars for gold. Um, so let's just say that what Saddam tried in 2000, which failed, and what Gaddafi tried in the late 2000s, which failed, succeeds with Putin then or China. Let's just say it does. So if it does, you have the end of the dollar's uh, dominance as the global reserve currency. Dollars come back to the United States, cause hyperinflation, bad times, fighting in the streets, <clears throat> like we're seeing in much other parts of the world. We'll see it here more and more as America's global hegemonic domination suddenly ends overnight with the proviso that the United States would still retain the world's most terrifying military industrial complex. Not a good combination in my opinion. I mean, think about it. So what would that mean? Uh, well, one thing could mean is that some crazy American policy, neoconservative policymakers might think, let's start another war and we could have a real conflagration on our hands, a bad one. But it could also mean uh, a premature disclosure. So uh, one of the, the ideas that I've kicked around for years is that, um, at least my observation, is that at times around the world when there's significant regime change, there are moments where important UFO information leaks out. And uh, the examples that I've often thought of would be uh, the death of, of Francisco Franco in Spain in 1975. That resulted in the release of quite a few hundreds of Spanish military UFO reports after his death. When Mao Zedong died in China in 1976, a significant period of openness um, on, on many fronts, but including UFOs, occurred in China uh, in the aftermath of that. Uh, in the aftermath of America's great political crisis of Watergate, we had an opening up in the uh, Freedom of Information Act, which resulted in a significant number of UFO documents coming out through Freedom of Information. Uh, so much so that I think it constituted a real crisis by the late 70s, early 80s, a crisis that was dealt with by U.S. counterintelligence in the form of disinformation. That's another story, but it happened. When the Soviet Union went through its final crisis and collapse in the late 80s and early 90s, we saw the one moment in Russian history where a lot of UFO data uh, came out. So-called KGB files and much more in terms of Russian media. Um, a tremendous amount of information came out in terms of UFOs that we now have in the public domain. So it's in the moments of major crisis, not you know, minor, but really major crisis, that you get this type of opening that will occur. Now, in the case of the United States, the biggest and toughest of the nations, and with the most UFO information to spill, I could imagine that such a scenario could occur, that some insider sees a window of opportunity, so to speak, and starts leaking information, a la Edward Snowden type of a scenario, something along those lines. I could see that. I, I don't know that that will happen, but I could see that happening. Um, you know, and again, not simply the UFO phenomenon, there's obviously 9-11 that can come out. Um, and there's a lot more that might come out in such a crisis scenario. Uh, 
And I think any number of these types of revelations could certainly be revolutionary. Um, when I talk about is there a possibility of a diversion from disclosure, uh, I, I say that just to, for us to keep in mind that the US media complex is very, very powerful still. Even though we have an alternative media, uh, what we call mainstream media is, is still quite, quite significant and, um, and works hand in glove with the political powers. So by diversions from disclosure could be one or another types of false flags or just different types of media spin to divert attention away. But I think a, a premature disclosure is a real possibility. Again, what about other nations in this scenario? If the US hegemonic power suddenly collapses in a significant way quickly, what about Russia? Uh, many of you, I think, fam are familiar with this. this is Dmitry Medvedev, who's the prime minister of Russia. He's widely understood as the number two political power in Russia behind Putin. Made a statement just a couple of years ago, seemingly off the cuff, to a couple of uh, Russian journalists on camera, and um, they asked him about UFOs. And he um, spoke in a very serious manner. This did not seem to be a joke, as far as I could tell. And he says, along with the briefcase with nuclear codes, the president of the country is given a special top secret folder. This folder in its entirety contains information about aliens who visited our planet. Along with this, you are given a report of the absolutely secret special service that exercises control over aliens on the territory of our country. And then he makes a statement that the Western media latched onto and made a big joke out of. He says, more detailed information on this topic you can get from a well-known movie called Men in Black. <laughs> I will not tell you how many of them are among us because it may cause panic. And everyone said, ha ha, he's making a big joke. But uh, actually, it's all in the translation. And the, uh, apparently, the more accurate translation, at least this is the uh, sources that I've been looking at, he says, you can receive more detailed information having watched the documentary film, Men in Black, and that is not the Hollywood movie, Men in Black, with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. This is a Russian documentary called Men in Black, which is, in fact, a serious treatment of the UFO phenomenon. And it's very likely that that was what Dmitry Medvedev was talking about in his statement. And again, as you see him in this video, and it's widely available on YouTube, um, the, the, the journalist who he's got in front of him, she's chuckling. I mean, she's laughing. Of course, that's a common type of reaction. I mean, you often get this type of laughter among people when they hear talk about UFOs. It's almost like they don't know how else to respond. But it's Medvedev who's interesting because he's quite serious the whole time. That's my take on it. But does that mean that Russia would disclose? I don't think so. I don't think Russia is any more motivated to disclose UFOs in the United States. A, they're massively dependent on exporting their oil and their natural gas. And it just seems to me that, again, a disclosure on the UFO phenomenon is going to have serious repercussions on the petroleum industry. It's only going to be a matter of time. Even if, um, say, the president or some other powerful person were to acknowledge that this is real and were to say, well, we don't know what their source of power is, that's really not going to stop the revolution from happening because the biggest obstacle toward a new scientific breakthrough, I would suggest, is simply knowing whether or not you can do it. If you know such a thing is possible, that's more than half the battle right there, if you know it's possible. So if you know it's possible to have some sort of genuine field propulsion, anti-gravity, which I'm, I would say I'm pretty confident does exist already in the classified world, but if you know it's possible, you're going to come up with it. It won't be that long a period of time. And bye-bye petroleum, bye-bye petrodollar, bye-bye bye -bye ISIS, bye-bye wars in the Middle East, I mean, a lot of good things will come out of that, but also goodbye petroleum-dominated infrastructure. And uh, it's a tremendous amount of global transformation as a result of that. So, uh, you know, Russia, I don't think, is going to be motivated. And China, I, you know, probably not. You've got to... Now, maybe, maybe there will be forward-looking people in some of these nations, and they just may say, screw it, let's just go for it. We're going we're to talk about it. 
maybe that will happen. Um, you know, there have been suggestions in the, the recent struggling over Ukraine that, uh, I, I read this, I don't know if this is accurate, that Putin was holding the 9-11 card over the United States. In other words, that he had information about 9-11 and was willing to show that to the world. I'm thinking, cool man, go for it. You know, do it. He hasn't done it. Maybe it's not true, I don't know. But would they hold the UFO card? You know, if things got pretty bad. I don't, I don't think so. I think most nations in the world probably don't have enough specific knowledge anyway. Uh, when you, again, I was talking about military spending globally a little while ago, and I said U.S. and its key allies account for about 85% of the global military spending. That's true. And, but actually, most of that spending is within the top, really, 20 nations. Now, there's officially 200 or almost 200 nations in the world, but the top 20 really account for, I think, something like 90% of all military spending. So they're the ones that really matter. And um, I assume that those are the ones that actually have some specific knowledge on the matter of UFOs. And most of them are in the pocket of the US. So the, most of the other nations really are not going to matter because they don't really have, they don't have the intelligence community infrastructure, they don't have the military infrastructure that would allow them to have the knowledge or at least to be able to compete with what the US knows. So it's actually a pretty small group of nations, in fact, that I think could have the ability to do this, and again, most are in the control of the US, except Russia and China, which are not. So that's the, that's the premature disclosure. I'm gonna talk about the preferred disclosure. This is the disclosure that I think our, our betters would like us to have. I call it their preferred disclosure. Um, I see our world right now as in the midst of a great race, and it, that one of the races is between us, the people, and our handlers. So, here's one problem. We have, over the last 20 years in particular, greater social awareness, greater political awareness, primarily because of the web. The World Wide Web has allowed us a, a universe of information that was unimaginable a generation ago. It's allowed us to have communication with each other on a, on a global scale that was not imaginable a generation ago, even not even 10 years ago, basically. And now, this is our world, it's incredible. So that is a problem. Solution to that problem is uh, control the web. You know, we see this more and more. There's all kinds of laws being enacted in Britain, in the United States, in France, to monitor, in Australia, everywhere else, to monitor web traffic, to monitor what you watch on the web, and to make certain things illegal, to protect certain populations, et cetera, et cetera. But what you're seeing is it's a surveillance that's going on, and a control, and a censorship. And now in the uh, wake of the Charlie Hebdo shooting in France, uh, you're seeing certain types of speech in France now are being banned, and so on and on and on. So it's control. Uh, another problem, I think this is at least as significant, maybe more, is the uh, threat of sharing breakthrough ideas and technologies. A couple of years ago, I, did a, I was at a conference on breakthrough energy over in Boulder, Colorado. It was a real eye-opener for me. I was the, uh, the sole... I think I was the only UFO researcher there, and there were a lot of these brilliant inventors at this conference working on what we would call free energy devices. They call it energy harvesting. Um, very, you know, practically minded uh, people. These are not wide-eyed uh, idealists. They're often, I think, brilliantly scientific. I don't know that all of their ideas are, are valid, but I have to suspect some may be pretty valid. And uh, my imagining is that at some point around the world, some smart person is going to be able to upload their own version of a portable free energy device that allow you to go off the grid and say, up yours, utility company, and you hook it up to your, right, you hook it up to your house and you got your free energy. Is it really that impossible? I don't think it's impossible. And with, um, with next generation 3D printing technology that will allow for mixed materials and will allow probably to print integrated circuits and who knows what else, you probably have access to printing one of those suckers and you can plug it in and you're good. Now that's a great thing. Of course, that allows you a certain level of independence from the system that may not be desirable. And so for that reason, now we hear, you know, we get the, the fear mongering of 3D printing guns. God forbid, my goodness, your neighbor can 3D print a gun. We've got to stop 3D printing. This is the kind of fear-mongering that we're starting to see. 
But I really think that the, the core of it is to prevent people from having access to truly amazing ideas that are coming down the pike. We can't even begin to imagine the revolution that's ahead of us in that, in that technology. And it's moving so fast, so fast. So the solution to that is you control the web and you control international law and you create institutions like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement and you nail down intellectual property rights so that some smart person in Mumbai, India, who may come up with a device, but it breaks classified US patents that are in the black budget community. Sorry, Charlie, you can't have that. And you can't upload it. This is what I think is happening. So it's the creation of a global system to protect, to protect the classified black budget world that's got the breakthrough patents that they will not share with the rest of the world. And there are many such patents. I don't know how many. I had a long chat with Tom Malone, who is a, a very, very intelligent uh, guy who's written a number of books on electrogravitics and worked at the U.S. Patent Office for years. And, um, you know, his assessment is that there are thousands of classified patents and a large number of them deal with energy. I'm sure that's right. So, you control that. Another problem is we have arrested population due to the, you know, less and less decent jobs that there are. And that's by design because we're kind of expensive, but people in China are cheap. People in Indonesia are cheap. And so what you do is you set up a situation where labor gets exported. And this is all in flux because at some point they're all going to be robots anyway. China's roboticizing much of their workforce. And there's actually a phrase now called the robo-apocalypse. It's being used by economists and it's not as a joke. So we're moving toward an era where the workforce is being utterly transformed. And what are we going to do with all these people? It's a real question. Um, people are going to get restive. They're going to start protesting. You're going to start putting in uh, all kinds of um, you know, measures to control these people. The solution to arrest a population is you create a police state, which of course is what we are seeing. This is long-term goals. This is a long-term goal. Now there's another great race. I hinted at this earlier. Let's call it between the breakaway civilization and the others. I like to use that phrase. I don't know that they're aliens. I suspect that they may be extraterrestrials, but I don't really know. I don't want to pretend to know, but I think they're not us. And um, there's a couple of possibilities going on in that relationship. One is that we're their vassals or we're hostages to them to some extent. One is that um, our leaders or our betters are working for them. I do say betters facetiously, I hope you realize. Um, but that our leadership is working for them, kind of like, you know, um, the way leaders of developing nations work for uh, U.S. corporate power. You know, you enslave your people and you get a payoff. Um, I guess there's a possibility, I guess I wouldn't want to rule it out, that our leadership is working against them on behalf of humanity, like in a Hollywood movie, to save humanity from the clutches of evil aliens. Hey, maybe. Um, a couple of other possibilities. It could be that we're dealing with multiple groups of other beings, not all of whom are out to, to enslave us. I'm not saying they all are. I don't know. Um, maybe some of them are benign. Maybe. Um, whatever the case is, however, our, we're, we're at a unique moment in human history. Think about this. For all of the sum total of our history, these other beings could interact here on Earth probably with total impunity and total ability to do whatever they wanted without anyone bugging them because really, what could we do? You know, back in pre-20th century, the only way to see a UFO would be to look up at the sky. And there weren't as many of us back then. And there was many, many areas of the world that were uncharted. Now we have the 20th and 21st century with electronic means of detection, radar and other electronic means. We've got the ability to detect them now. And what I think that means is that the advanced guard of our civilization, that is our national security intelligence community, they've obviously figured it out. They've detected it. We're at this interim stage, and more and more of us are figuring it out too, but they are thinking, we don't really want you to know this yet, and we're holding on to this secret, but it really can't be indefinitely. Cannot possibly be indefinitely. So, but anyway, so I think their attitude is they're playing catch up. They see this very advanced intelligence, this very advanced species that probably doesn't even think like we do, 
but they're thinking we need to catch up and so therefore the, how are we going to do that well we can't really play by the rules of letting people know about all of this we're going to have to create an authoritarian system we have to control clamp down our power create a hierarchical authoritarian state and then once we've achieved our goals vis-a-vis -vis these others then maybe we'll let the people know what's going on so therefore I would suggest before any kind of that disclosure what they're kind of want to do and I've sort of been talking about this they want to enforce intellectual property rights that means no free file sharing you know in the future version of the pirate bay or whatever they want to create a police state of total surveillance and total intimidation because if you're being surveilled you're being intimidated and you're not free if you are monitored at every street corner with facial recognition um, and you want to protest good luck you know in Canada right now it's illegal to protest with the masks not allowed to do it is that the case in the US I'm not sure not yet it, it is the case in other countries increasingly so it's a they want total recognition of you and and the design is to intimidate you is to make you afraid to make you go through your life with your head down and hopefully not to get noticed uh, the other thing they want to do is turn the web into television they're doing that now this image this is a real image this is of uh, I think this is Samsung yeah smart TV type thing so look how they got it set up um, you've got your um, you know they're, they're corralling you they're guiding you so your Facebook and your Netflix and your Hulu Plus and your Skype and your History Channel which I was on last night by the way <laughs> and your Wall Street <laughs> and your that guy's just, uh, Wall Street Journal oh there's a good one and USA Today, useless SA Today, and all the others uh, to, to, guide, to guide your web experience. You know, and this is the future of the web. This is what they're, they're trying to do to us. They call it Smart Hub. No, let's call it Dumb Hub, because that's really what it is. But that's the direction. And then as I was um, kind of hinting at uh, one of the necessary things in the world for them to achieve this purpose is the creation of false flags on uh, what appears to be a nearly continuous basis. I mean, we have 9-11, we have the weapons of mass destruction, the fictitious weapons of mass destruction. We have 7-7, we've got the uh, increasingly number of, uh, you know, scares to inject you with all kinds of pharmaceuticals. We've got the uh, fictitious chemical weapons shenanigans of Syria from 2013. We've got Boston bombing um, and uh, Malaysia and ISIS and much, much, much more. And the point of these as I think you now uh, have, have gathered from uh, what I've been talking about is A, to allow the United States dominated group to engage in regime change that they cannot otherwise engage in to pass laws that they cannot otherwise justify as a way to create this kind of system that they feel they need to create um, my feeling is that once they've gotten what they want they probably won't need the false flags I've been looking over the history of false flags quite a lot lately and what I notice is that uh, when I identify probable false flags over the past let's say century or so especially since the end of World War II it seems to me that the largest number of them are committed by the United States US gets the gold in false flags and Israel gets the silver and Britain gets the bronze if there was an Olympics that's how it would go I look for false flags among other, other nations like Russia, Soviet Union, don't find too many. 1999, the Chechen crisis was false flags by the FSB and that's what got Putin into power. They're not immune to doing false flags. A lot of those bombings were done by the, the security services it looks like, not by the Chechens. So I mean you get them everywhere but the US seems to do the most and I ask myself this question, why would that be? Why would US, Britain and Israel and Canada now they're getting into it and a number of these other nations um, why would they do this and I think my best answer is twofold one is that those nations historically have felt that their populations I should say have felt that they are free and those populations have felt that they have some say over how things are being done I mean back in the old days of Stalin um, if you didn't really agree with the government well, you, you know, you get a 3 a.m. knock on the door and they take you off to Lubyanka or one of the mental hospitals. They didn't really need to do false flags to convince you about things. They just did what they did. Uh, but in a system where you have a population that needs 
to f pretend that it's participating or in, in the power, you've got you've to work their emotions. And the false flag is the ultimate, it's like the Rolls Royce in the toolkit of, uh, of covert ops and propaganda. Um, and, and so it's necessary in certain instances to work the population that way. Now, it's a dangerous game to do false flag. You can get caught. So it's necessary. It's only a few nations that really can do it. You have to have total control over the media. That's one thing. Or you're not going to get away with it. You have to ensure yourself that you have a totally compliant media, which, which we have in the United States. We have a completely compliant mainstream media, All right, as do the other Western countries. That's one thing. The other thing is you have to have a very expert group of covert ops teams who are the best in the world at what they do. And again, you've got that in a few of these nations. US, yes. Israel, yes. Britain, yes. A few of the other nations have them too. Russia's got it as well, but Russia doesn't have control over the Western media. So if Russia were to do these things, they'd have to be very careful. They'd have to be careful. US is in a better position. That's why I think it's happening. And the other reason that the US is leading is because the US is most interested in creating a global transformation because it's in the best position to lead that transformation and dominate. So they're motivated. That's why we're seeing it. That's why we're seeing all of this stuff happening. I, I included the Malaysia thing there. If you remember last July, that was shot down over eastern Ukraine and immediately John Kerry blamed the Russians. That's not the truth, man. That's not what happened. Uh, that thing was shot down from the air and you can look at the photographs of the, uh, of the uh, pilot cockpit there. That was not from a buck missile from, from below by Russian uh, separatists, no. That was from an Air Force, and that was a Ukrainian Air Force. And ever since then, since that information has come out, you've noticed no one's talking about that anymore. But the US can't really back away from it either because they committed themselves to that position. Anyway, that's, I th oh, and incidentally regarding that, which I think is almost funny, kind of in a twisted way, um, Putin flew through that airspace 24 hours earlier. He had been coming back from Brazil from the conference where they established their version of the IMF. So think, imagine you're Putin and you've just flown through that airspace and then 24 hours later, boom, the aircraft go, gets shot down. Do you think they were trying to knock him off? Yeah, maybe, a little bit. So anyway, I think this is what we're looking at. One of the things to notice about these false flags, by the way, just to keep an eye out, is when you start hearing these slogans, the slogans come out immediately as if they come right out of a Madison Avenue, uh, you know, office. Um, you know, je suis Charlie, you know, immediately someone writes that and it goes, it goes viral within a day. You see thousands of the placards all printed up. Who printed these things up? Thousands of them immediately. Or after the Boston Marathon, Boston strong. Really, Boston? I don't think so. 19,000 militarized police going through your house, no more Third and Fourth Amendments. Not so strong. I love Boston, but uh, I wasn't too happy about that moment. But this is slogans and the immediate identification of the culprit, instant almost nowadays. You've got to be careful. We have to, we have to use our heads with these. And let's not be like cattle with a ring through our nose being led to the field wherever they want us to, to do that. So I think we're increasingly we're becoming a little more aware over the fact that we're being played like a violin. Um, and hopefully we can use some of the knowledge in, um, in being a little more skeptical of these major events that are happening. Sadly, um, it's in org groups like where we are here today that I think many people are kind of wise to things. Uh, nevertheless, when we go and talk to many of our friends and neighbors, it's, it's still not there yet. So um, I think part of our job, honestly, is to be brave and to um, not, not to hesitate to speak out. What's the worst that's going to happen? You know, people think you're crazy. Well, get used to it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I think, so this is the goal, and the goal ultimately is to maintain total control over global intellectual life. That's, that's what it's about. Branding over the world and controlling. It's Orwellian. It's, uh, it's out of Huxley and Orwell, and it really hasn't changed. Um, that's preferred disclosure, and um, I haven't actually even gotten to the full preferred disclosure, so that was just the overview. When I ask myself, what is, is there an end game pardon me, that the, um, our handlers have vis-a-vis -vis these others in their desperate attempt to catch up, 
and their imagined attempt to catch up. I like to look ahead at the world 50 years from now and see if I can, if I can figure this out. Um, obviously, I will fail, but let's just think about some of the things that we are confident are going to happen in our world in 50 years that people are thinking about. So advanced artificial intelligence, that is past what is known as the singularity, that is computers that are going to be way smarter than we are, that will be able to think and sound really cool and come up with better music and come up with better ideas, and we're just going to be having a major inferiority complex, probably. But advanced AI, quantum computing, which may exist in the NSA, who knows, but uh, we're certainly going to have it out there. And, then, and that revolutionizes computing in a major, major way. Complete DNA control. So basically the creation of like super, super humans. Um, you know, cutting off the aging process, creating super intelligence, super strength. I mean, all of us, we're right there. Do you think they're going to let the whole world do that? Us? Doubt it. Uh, maybe if you can afford it. You can afford it, it'll be for very few. We're really looking at the, the dire possibility of uh, what guys like Hitler dreamed of, that is a master race. It really could happen. And it sounds crazy, but actually think about it, it really does, it could happen. Um, implants for superpowers, this exists in the military right now already, and some of the advanced uh, covert op teams. Um, all types of implants are available for them. Organic 3D printing, replacement organs and the like. Uh, basically what I'm talking about is a class-based transhumanism. Uh, a utopia, as I say, for those who can afford it. Not, not the best future. In such a future, with all of that nailed down, then we will start seeing a disclosure. This is how their plan would be. So they would eventually start revealing public uh, breakaway technology. That's a, a, a artist's rendition of a UFO sighting that I personally investigated that was over in Kingston, Ontario back in 2003. I got to know this witness. She's like a sister to me now. Very, very clear sighting of a perfect black triangle with sharp edges over the road. Um, that type of technology, I think, will be openly revealed as well as uh, what we might call disclosure only in this environment. That is, after a 24-7, all-encompassing, virtual fascist society has been completely implemented. That is total control. When total control has been revealed, uh, 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 when total control has been obtained, rather, disclosure, their preferred disclosure will then come because it won't matter. They'll have complete mastery of the situation and you and I won't be able to do anything about it. And of course, it'll be complete with their spin, obviously, uh, which we won't be able to compete with. So I think that's the preferred uh, situation. I think that's what the, the powers that be would do if they have their way. Uh, there's a third version of disclosure. I call it people-driven disclosure. I think um, this is what we're trying to do. I think this is what we're trying to do. Um, someone said to me earlier this afternoon that they, they thought that the TV show Hangar One was a kind of disclosure show. And I, I really had to think about that. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, it, it is kind of, it's TV, so right off the bat, you, you have, we have to be kind of uh, careful about that. Um, I am happy about uh, one important thing about that show, which is that it is more politically oriented than any of the other UFO documentary series that I'm aware of, and um, for that reason, I was very happy to participate in it. But I think what's happening is that on a, a, a societal level, there is a greater uh, awareness among people that this phenomenon is a genuine phenomenon, it's important. And so I think, and we're also in an era now of, of groups like WikiLeaks and Anonymous and Hackers and Edward Snowden. Um, what that means is like they, they were not really possible a decade ago. They didn't, they didn't have anything like that a decade ago. And that's because we didn't have a global infrastructure that was able to support that, the, the ability to rip digital data out of a computer system and throw it out for the world to see, whether legally or not, it's irrelevant. The ability now is here, and this is what we're seeing in the world. We're seeing people who are increasingly trying to do this. And that's not going to go away. And uh, for my part, I, I see that as a very necessary and a positive thing. I don't really care that certain governments think that some of these things are illegal. I think that, uh, first of all, it's an inevitability when you have an increasingly repressive sy uh, system that's being put into place, and that's what we have, you know, anyone with eyes can see it, you're gonna have a reaction against it. And, and groups like WikiLeaks are part of that reaction. Um, and I think that they should be supported. So I think, and, and also groups and individuals that engage in good UFO research, yes, 
that should be supported in whatever way is reasonable. Um, generally, the population, we have to be a little more critically minded in our thinking. I don't think that it's a good idea for us to copy and paste every Facebook rumor that comes our way. Um, I do think, and this is, I wrote about this in my most recent book, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. Um, just, you know, there are, there are simple ways for us as uh, private researchers, all of us, to uh, fact, check, fact, fact check a little more easily. Um, things like reverse image search through Google are very, very useful in many ways. Things like search by date to find the genesis of a particular idea. How did a particular idea or a fact first appear on the web? Well, you can figure it out. It's not that hard. You do search by date in the Google uh, feature. It's a very useful tool. I wrote about how to use it in my book, but you can figure it out on your own. Just, uh, I know I'm running out of time here. Um, I was on a Facebook thread a couple, about two years ago, and um, I was like, me and like 90 other people got this, e this Facebook message. And there's, you know, I get these all the time. And a researcher was, uh, had a picture of a giant cyclops skeleton. So it was like a 20 foot long cyclops, and it was a one eyed, uh, one socket in the middle. And he was saying, this, look, this is proof of uh, cyclop giants of the past. And I just thought, you know, all right, so I, I took out 10 minutes, five minutes, and I downloaded the image, I did a reverse image search by date, and I found, literally it took me five minutes to find out that that image was created in a contest, uh, an Adobe Photoshop contest from like 2004. It, it really, it was five minutes of my life that I'll never get back again. But, so I wrote back to the guy, I said, look, I, I just want you to know this is, this is a Photoshop, this is not a real thing. And this is what was disheartening, and I'm not kidding. He said, well, Mr. Dolan, I, um, you're a respected researcher, so I'll take your word for it. And I said, no, don't take my word for it. I mean, you just made me do all this work. You could have done the work. You could have done exactly what I did. I, I'm not special in this way. This, this ability here is, lies with you as well. All you have to do is figure it out. Check, check, do your work. So I think, you know, we can do this. There's a tendency that people have, all of us, and I think we all fall into this, that we, we tend to uh, accept authoritative information that comes down and we don't question it. We don't question it. But we, we have to, especially when it comes from so-called authoritative sources, especially when police say, we've, we've gotten the suspect, we know who did it, we got him. Uh, well, question. Question it always. Uh, <clears throat> I homeschooled both of my children when they were much younger. I'm not saying everyone should homeschool, but I think it was a great decision for us. In other words, what I'm suggesting is um, to the extent that you are able to opt out of the great encompassing system that just wants to chew you up and spit you out, then do it. It's not possible for everyone, but there's things to do. If you're able to make a living while uh, running your own business and doing your own, following your dream, I say do it. Absolutely do it. This is, this is your life, this is your opportunity. Um, why spend your life feeding the machine when you have an opportunity to be independent? It's hard. I mean, um, I made many, many sacrifices. I've always worked for myself, always. And uh, I'm sure I've taken a financial hit, but I look back, I have no regrets over that. And I've been able to maintain my own independence, which has been important for me as a researcher. Um, engaging in pragmatic citizen action when possible, focused citizen action support a free web, inspire people, inspire others. I think it's probably the most important thing we can do is to, um, again, be brave and realize that we all have the ability to inspire those of us around us. 20 years ago, a little more than that, I started looking at the UFO phenomenon and I did have the thought, how could I possibly think that I could write about this subject when there are all of these other people who've written so much more, they know so much more about this than I. Who am I to think that I could put myself up there and write my own ideas out there? I mean, that's arrogant. And I really did have this thought, but I, for whatever reason, I went ahead and I did it. And I'm glad, I'm glad that I did it. And I get to talk here to all of you today. Um, but I, I would say that if, if, you know, if you're in a situation where you're thinking the same thought, put the thought away. Go out there and just do it. The worst that happens is it doesn't turn out the way you want, but that's okay. You've at least given it a try. And you've inspired, you probably will inspire other people along the way. So, um, the last thing I'll say is that um, uh, any kind of disclosure event that happens, I've got five minutes to go here, so I'm gonna wrap this up. 
um, is probably going to trigger massive unrest in a lot of other ways. I mean, think about it. If we learn that the government or the governments of the world have been lying to us about this topic, this big important topic of the presence of others here on planet Earth, we'll be asking, what else have you lied about? And, um, you know, remember Occupy Wall Street, what about Occupy Area 51, Occupy Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Occupy Washington, yeah, it could happen. A lot of questions will come up. Um, I'm going to skip by, by this because I'm, I just want to hit one more. Well, very ba basically quickly, I think what we'll have to do in a post-disclosure world, I think it'll see a major house cleaning. This is what I would like to see. I would like to see a major house cleaning. That is political blowback, finding out have you kept a secret from us all this time, and yes, there would have to be uh, some kind of very, very significant legal repercussions as a result. We have to kill the black budget, the whole culture of the black budget, which is anathema to any kind of freedom-loving people, to have a system of uh, all of your money, my money, going into an unaccountable system that's basically involved in criminal acts. Uh, declassifying the energy, the patented energy technologies that are holding our future hostage from us and to kill the stranglehold on our world by petroleum, which I hope you understand by now. My lecture has explained this caused a lot of pain and a lot of grief in this world and ending the UFO secrecy can go a long way toward ending the petroleum dominance of our world. Shining a lot on criminality. I'd like to see killing privatized, centralized, fractional reserve banking. Hey, that's just me. I, f I figure once you're in, once you're cleaning house, just like do the whole thing and start over and, uh, and do much, much more that's good. I don't know how easy this is going to be. I think it'll take generations, centuries. It'll be messy. It won't be easy. I'm not saying we're going to hit utopia. I'm not a utopian. I think it'll be very, very unpleasant for a while. But what's the alternative? You know, the alternative is just going the way we are, which is a series of lies and pain and suffering and millions and billions of people uh, living a life of privation. So that's not good either. I think we can do better. Um, the final question is, what are we dealing with? Who are these other beings that we're dealing with? Uh, Linda Moulton Howe in her last lecture, I think, was very brilliant in talking about um, you know, one possibility. I don't know what the possibilities of these beings are. I mean, there's a number. I do think extraterrestrial is a very, very strong possibility. Are they greys? Are they uh, humanoid? That uh, image on the bottom there is from a, a case from 1994 in Australia. Uh, looks like a good case. I think, as I said earlier, they've been here probably a long time. Um, if we are to take the reports seriously that we have of various encounters, they're intensely telepathic. They are way different than us intellectually. They probably have a different type of society. Um, one of the um, best descriptions I came across is almost like a beehive type of mentality. They don't have, they don't appear, at least this is from abductees talking. They don't have the kind of individualism that we uh, like to think that we have. There's, if they're all reading each other's thoughts, it might be a little bit different for them to have the type of individualism that we have. I guess also that they may not have the same kind of emotional reactions that we have. We being mammals who are raised uh, bonding with our mothers for several years, receiving unconditional love from our earliest moment that we're alive and having a desire to achieve unconditional love for the rest of our lives. What if you don't have that? What if you're raised in an artificial type of environment or if you're genetically created or, if, you know, all kinds of possibilities. They may not have our emotional reactions. They may find our emotions fascinating, incomprehensible perhaps. Maybe that's one reason we're interesting to them. But if that's what they are, then we may really be at a loss of trying to deal with them very easily. Uh, we may never really have the ability truly to understand them in a way. And what if they have a mastery of space and time in ways that we quite just don't have? Um, you know, we tend to, we perceive reality through space and through time. That's the way our brains order reality. We do understand mathematically that space and time don't quite work that way. What if they have a mastery over space and time in, intrinsically, intellectually, that we don't have? There's just all kinds of possibilities. It may be difficult. I sometimes think that we'll really never truly understand who we're dealing with. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, you know. But um, whether we'll actually succeed, I, I don't know. So therefore, are we ready for open contact? I would say we're never going to be ready for open contact. But that will not stop it. Won't stop it. Just because we are not ready for something doesn't mean it won't happen. <laughs> you know, it's, we're, we're on a train. This is how I see it. Our civilization is on a high-speed train. And uh, there's no getting off. You know, there's a destination. 
ahead of us and we're, we're going to reach that destination like it or not. I don't, I don't think there's a lot we can do to stop it at this point. Wow, how did that happen? I would like to thank you very, very much for your time. It's been a pleasure being here. And I hope we all get together this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much.